Time being six o'clock, I'll call this meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Here. 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 We have quorum. Does anybody have a financial or non financial conflict of interest? No. 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 I have no. None. I would entertain any additions or corrections to the agenda. No. Move approval. Second. Sec Motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. This time, uh, open it up for public comment. If anyone would like to make a general public comment, um, now would be your time and you're more than welcome. Dennis, come on forward. I'm the only name on the list. So. <laughs> Dennis Michael, 304-28-437th Avenue. Um, just a quick comment, maybe, or a, or a thought. I know that you can't make any decisions at, at this point, and I'm, that's not what I'm here for, but what I would like to do is maybe see some possible thought toward a directive to the highway department to kind of put a moratorium on blading the roads when we're so dry. As, as we are right now. Um, he bladed last week and the dust, all he's moving is dust across the road so bad. And we're getting, we're in a dry time of the year, really dry situation anyway, but we're getting close to harvest. And when you start getting those big trucks rolling down those, those gravel roads, it just is choking and blinding out there and it's gonna cause a problem. And it's, it's not really um, helping the roads much at all because it's just like I say, all he's doing is sliding the dust from one side to the other, it's hard on equipment. Um, and until they we get some accumulative moisture to where the roads will actually it'll do a, a job it's best just to get that track down the center so you can travel and not blind everybody out um that's basically all i have to say i just this last week he's come in there and, and they belated and it's just been a cloud the whole week since he's left so that'd be something to think about thank you thank you Anybody else care to make public comment at this point? Hearing and seeing none public comment is closed. We'll go to item five, Veterans Service Quarterly Report. Come on forward, Cody. Hello, how are you all tonight? Good so far. Okay, I'm trying to stay close to the mic and talk slowly. I have a lot to go over. So first we'll go over my contact issues report year to date. Um, I'm just going to do that real quick. May, I was up 93. June, I was up 27. In July, I was down 33. In April, technically, I was up 113 because there was absolutely no record last year from April because that was the switch over. So way you can look at it is I'm up. Um, the GDX report came out. I had mentioned that in the budget. Um, right now, our veteran population is 813 veterans in Yankton County, according to the VA that are receiving services. Um, so this is actually 31 veterans down from last year, but I have way more than that in pending claims right now. That would be brand new to the VA to be able to get them in. So, and some of those are National Guard, and the only way I can get them enrolled in VA healthcare is if I get them through the claims. Okay, then I did some other math then for the GDX last year, total amounts back to Yankton County through all programs through the VA was 14,046,000. So just a tad over 40, 14 million is what we brought in last year is what the veterans brought in. To, Yank, to Yankton County. To Yankton. These are Yankton County residents. Then for my in office numbers for claims for the month of April, 14 were um, came back. That was a total of 
16,501.49. May 12 came back with uh, 11,613.44. June only nine came back with $7,008.62. So the total approved in this quarter were 35. So that shows you that they're down. And total money was 35,123.55. We had quite a bit of retroactive payments that came back. So people who were waiting forever for their claims to come in, their retroactive amounts was $72,230.04. So for this whole quarter for new money um, is $107,354.28. Just for this quarter, so it's good, um, but claims have slowed down a lot. Cody, uh, can you project how many veterans are in Yankton County that are not? I don't even want to guess because you got ones who, for whatever reason, don't want to file their claims. They they all have different reasons. Then you have some people who. Um, are considered veterans underneath state law, but underneath federal aren't. And the figures that you present here, they're for Yankton County and other counties that come to you for assistance. This is just the veteran population in Yankton County. But that's just Yankton County. By the the GDX is just by the Yankton County, the 18, the 1,813. That's what the VA says live in this county. The other numbers that I gave you of the claims that I did, those are just the claims that I did through my office. I can't tell you right now what county they live in or if they even live in the state because I've been doing a lot of claims for Nebraska now too. So, um, had coffee with vets in April, May, and June. I attended the VFW service officers training in San Antonio and I just received my certificate of completion, which means I passed. Um, I applied and was approved as a commemorative partner for Vietnam veterans. So those really nice lapel pins that we give out, I can do that and I can get more of those. So I can do actual events now. I just had them before, but now I'm actually certified. Um, put in a lot of volunteer hours at numerous events. Um, the reason why I do that is twofold. One, it's good to give back to the community. And two, because it's good visibility for my office. Um, I talked to a lot of people and hand out a lot of cards at that. Check days was huge for me. I went over and volunteered for four hours, the American Legion over there. That was big. I got two contacts out of that. And one of them said, oh, I'll never get anything. And it sounds like we're gonna. I attended the state national VFW conventions. Um, now this is where it gets tough. The DAV van and outlook of the future. DAV van, I found out yesterday that starting next month, we will most likely be down to one driver and the one driver is only able to drive once or twice a month. That's huge. I'm gonna be losing two drivers. It sounds like one is moving, another one is health conditions of another driver that's been out for about two months due to cancer treatment. Um, it's been extremely hard to find people to recruit. Uh, big one is, is you have to have a COVID vac, you have to be up to date on all your COVID vaccinations. A lot of people hang up as soon as you tell them that. Um, the other one is, is the physical. There is a physical with it, so it's not that easy. So um, I called my counterpart over in Clay County because the DAV van actually covers Yankton and Clay County. I called him. He said, hey, let me get on top of this, see what I can do, see if we can get some help. And I already saw today, he's blowing up social media trying to get us help from, from Vermillion. So we'll see how this works out. Um, getting drivers cleared all the way through the VA normally takes a six month process. I talked to the VA, they understand the urgency in our situation. They think they can push them through in about six weeks. Um, the DAV itself, Disabled Americans and Veterans of South Dakota, is aware of the situation. Um, we're made aware immediately yesterday when I was made aware, and they're working on it, and they're going to see what they can do to come up with it. Do However, your, do your drivers have to be veterans? No. No. Maybe we should put something out on our website and put something into the paper, because it seemed like that 
has helped in the past if anybody's interested I, uh, I did previously and I got two phone calls out of all that and they hung up on me when I said you need up-to-date COVID vaccinations so I'm willing to try it again though sure you know but Does anybody have an issue if we put something on our Facebook page about it and on the county website supported 100%. Yep. I think it's a good service I'd, I'd hate to lose in Yankton however I see the writing on the wall and I saw that back this winter. So I started on a program, talked to United Way, talked to, and then they ended up talking to Terry Kirchner. I already had a backup plan just in case. So um, Terry wrote up a grant, United Way granted $3,000 to Yankton Transit specifically for veterans and transportation. Um, Due to generosity of other veteran service organizations, they were able to donate $2,000. So the total sitting in our bank account in that account right now is $5,000 to get veterans to and from Sioux Falls. Uh, so with them, the only day that they're not able to go up is Wednesday. The, the bright part about this is they can't help us for the month of August, which is okay, because we're good for August. It's September that our problem. September is when they can start doing the transportation for us, and they can run four days a week. So I knew we were going to lose this probably in two years was my guess. I was projecting that. So I wanted to come up with a contingency plan. Thankfully, we got that enacted before. So, so what's their cost for a, a round trip? For the van? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing for the van. Because the DAV owns the van. The federal and the feds take care of all the maintenance on that van. They pay for all the fuel, everything. We don't pay a dime for it. Do they take multiple people or just usually one pe person? Whatever we have. If it's one person, it'll be one person. I don't let that van have more than three riders in it, a total of four. There is a back seat in there, but that is a very small space and most of our people are full-size adults so it's not a good idea so if i understand what you've told me cody the grant can never run out oh no 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 the grant is for transportation for the city transit so the city transit that costs us roughly 115 dollars a person that's what that's what i'm after Oh, okay. Yeah, that's so roughly $115 per person. So we got $5,000. We've got 47 trips. Yep. For one person. Yep. We'll be good. And and if you get more than one in there, then our price goes down too. So is, we got enough for the rest of this year. Is that just around Yankton then? Yep. Okay. And that's the issue is that Clay County then drops out. We won't be able to pick up veterans and Irene like we have in Viberg, in Vermillion. They Even all if fall you're short. going that way? But if the van's not going, is the issue. And however, if they're in Turner County, they qualify underneath ROCS for, the, for a van ride for free. So if they're a veteran and they're enrolled in the VA, they can get a free ride anyways. So... I've been look, trying to be creative and in looking into this. Clay County is the issue um, of what are we going to do and that. So that's why I contacted him. Um, so just giving you a heads up on that, but we're going to keep operating as long as we can and hopefully we can get more drivers and revive it. And then the last thing was an email that was sent out this morning. You all received it because I I was CC'd in it uh, for Operation Greenlight for the Veterans Campaign for November 7th through the 13th. Um, my question is, do you want to proceed with a resolution with it? Did you all read the email? Do we need, I, I, I read it. Do we need an email or can we I just do it? it? I mean, if you want me to do the resolution, I can fix that up because there's stuff in the proposed one that I got to delete. It looks like junk. Can't we just highlight green? But yeah. So if you want to do that, if you want to light up with green, the next question is, do you want to light up for green for that month, for that week, the 7th through the 13th? Can, can you explain the email? I, okay. I so the email was, it came out from the national 
National Association of County. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll have to yep. look. And uh, so they sent it out, and what it is is they're proposing that all the counties go green for the week of November 7th through 13th for veterans. And it's to light up the buildings and whatnot in the color green to recognize um, military and the veterans. So if you want to do it, the next question is, do you want it to be exterior, interior, or on top with bulbs? Because I actually talked to Jeff today because I'm like, hey, if I'm going to go in there and talk about this, I need to know <laughs> some stuff. And I want you on board too, because he's the one, they're going to be the ones doing the work, not me. I was going to say work with Jeff on what's reasonable expectations to get something done. And I think it'd probably be supportive. Okay. I, I just as long as we don't go, you know, overboard. Yeah, it's important and you know something small when people come through. But I, I, I know most of you know as a veteran, and I know most of the veterans. We we're proud of our service, but we don't want to push that on other people. You know, the quiet professional type. I don't want green lights around the whole building and stuff. So I'm it's, wondering <laughs> why it's green. Why not red? For military. Why is it? Why is it red, white, blue? Well, because God loves the army. <laughs> <laughs> army green. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's green. So, green. So the next question is: Is how much are you willing to spend? Jeff. Jeff goes. Find out how much they're willing to spend. Couldn't we just do like a. Dan, do you want to talk with them offline? Just yeah. kind of something that's tasteful and. Can I? Can we'll do something small like a poster or some small display that won't be disruptive to county business. Well, can't you put it in the entryways? Well, one on yeah. each side. What What the proposal is for lighting mm -hmm. up is green. I think they want green at night lights. the building to be lit up. And whatever, yeah. So. yeah. Maybe something about that veterans monument would be appropriate to something small and that doesn't cost the yeah i think thinking so even just some of those lights that light okay. up the veterans mind all right change I'll, them to green change them green for the week or something i'll uh, simple we'll, but i'll could keep it change, as affordable as possible Cody and i talked about it too is change those light bulbs those bulbs are special bulbs i found yeah. out and they're extremely expensive which yeah. bulbs are those they're on the three light bulbs the 12 light bulbs I'm thinking just some of those up gas lights or something. Yeah. yeah so any any ideas, please let us know. But if okay. you want us to, we can work with Dan on it. We've got time. So okay. Right. I think it's more and important that you let the public know what the color green is for. And than, that than than having a green light or, or and that that was another discussion we had was maybe we should get like a banner or something that we can put up. And have it on there exactly what does the green light mean and so i think we have i i think we could find somebody here in town that would be willing to do that at a pretty pretty reasonable cost considering what it's for good all right thank you don if you want to have you're not done are wanda you? for that matter to get a hold of cody okay. uh cody you, dan chuka oh shoot okay thanks that was not on my list this Saturday at one o'clock at the school auditorium, uh, 1 p.m. is the Danchuca Bridge. Um, I have the signs up in my office. They've been there since last week. Um, I am the point of contact, the local point of contact for that. So I will be there. I'm supposed to be there like an hour early and then be there for the whole event and get to follow around the Secretary of Veterans Affairs for the state like a little puppy dog, I guess. But I'll be there. Um, it it'll be a good event. All the all the this sign is actually much bigger than the other ones were, and they will be. I I have been informed all the other signs will be changed out. The other ones that we have already, and the reason why is when you're going down the road, you can't read the ones that are on there now because those signs are just too small. So they went almost double the size on them. And hopefully you can read them better. So just to clarify, it's the high school, not the middle school. Yeah, high school. Okay. Sorry. You just said the auditorium, the school auditorium. So 
Yeah, the high school auditorium. We need a motion to approve his report. Please. Second. Mo motion to approve. Aye. Just kidding. further discussion. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. Were you done? I was done. Okay. Just so wanted to make Cody. sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, item six, Mr. Hawkins. <laughs> Voluntold. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Um, in your package, you probably have the letter uh, that we had made up for you guys to take a look at. <clears throat> What's happening here is that the South Dakota EMT Association is um, taking on a project where they are attempting to change the classification for EMS workers in the South Dakota retirement system. Right now we're class A, uh, which is just regular retirement. <clears throat> they want to move us up to class B, which is public safety members. And if you take a look at that overview that has the highlighted text on it, um, that's taken from the South Dakota Retirement Service webpage. It's just some general information on there, but I highlighted some of the important parts to talk about tonight. They do have four classes of members. Again, we are class A general, but they wanna move us to class B public safety. Right now, class B public safety members in South Dakota Retirement System include uh, the state law enforcement officers, any municipal police officers, firefighters, county sheriffs, deputy county sheriffs, correctional security staff, parole agents, air rescue firefighters, campus security officers, court service officers, juvenile correction agents, conservation officers, and park rangers in the state of South Dakota. The one thing that it doesn't include in there is anyone in EMS. The reason that they have that classification is because um, it offers an earlier retirement and the, the job titles that I just read off to you that are in that classification, um, those are all very physically demanding jobs. And so they don't expect that a lot of people will be in those jobs to the age of retirement, 65, 67, depending on which classification that you're in. So right now the South Dakota EMT Association is trying to get us moved from class A to class B. Um, they sent us a packet of stuff that they want information uh, for any ambulance services that are contributing to South Dakota retirement like we are, we're working on that, getting that information back to them. But one of the things that they requested was the governing agency to write a letter of support similar to the one that was in that packet. Um, <clears throat> the, the biggest change, I guess, if we do move from class A to class B is that instead of a 6% match, it'll be an 8% match, uh, which will obviously in, increase that line item a little bit in the budget. Uh, we have currently eight full-time employees that are contributing. However, one of them is Brenda, and we're not sure if she would actually move from class A to class B because she doesn't do any of the EMS work. She's just secretary with her. So probably seven of us at this point would move from class A to class B and would have the 8% um, matching. Um, just did some quick figures. Um, obviously, initially, it's going to cost a little bit more monthly, but in the end... Um, because those employees are retiring at an earlier age, the amount that's invested from the county is really about the same. For example, I used $45,000 per year income for an employee. If they were to go for uh, 20 years in the retirement system at 6% matching, the county would be contributing $54,000 over those 20 years. If that's going to age 65 for retirement, if they were to go to 15 years and then retire at age 60, and you were to contribute 8% for 15 years instead, it's the exact same amount of money. It's still $54,000 that you're contributing. So um, that letter that was included in the packet that has sample letter stamped on it, I do have another version of that printed up if you guys decide that that's the kind of letter that you wanted to go with. So you guys have any questions about anything? Oh, you have it too? Oh, okay, Patty has it. So as, as far as the process, just walk through, this needs to be done legislatively. Yes. This isn't just everybody agrees to it and it automatically occurs. So it has to go through the legislature too. Yes. 
So your organization is trying to get support yes. from all of the folks affected to present that to the legislature. Yes, it's, it's your, likely going to happen. It's just getting support from all of the services. In your hypothetical, you estimated that they would write, retire at 60. Is that a mandatory retirement or a, I could retire? Could retire. Right now in class A, in order for you to retire in class A, um, it has to be your years of service plus your age have to add up to 85. And in class B, it's your years of service plus your age only have to add up to 75. So if I was to use me as an example, I would be eligible for that at age 59. Mm -hmm. So let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, certainly this is, um, I think we should treat the EMS workers similar to the other ones and the job you guys do is dangerous and difficult and, and uh, yeah the, the second part of that little uh, packet that i handed out to you tonight is a letter that was written by um the spearfish um administrator ambulance administrator and she is the secretary of the south dakota emt association so she has done a lot of the legwork so far she actually went to the legislature this past year and got this process started and realized that there was a lot more work to it than what she thought. And so she's now really digging in and doing a lot of this work. So that letter is uh, basically the information that explains why EMS is eligible to be moved up to that category. And it basically is, is saying that we do a lot of hard work, a lot of hard lifting. Um, our, our stretchers, once we get a stretcher loaded up with a patient on it, even just an average size patient, we're lifting over 300 pounds at that point. And, and uh, uh, there's a lot of physical exertion. There's a lot of uh, uh, carrying bags and equipment, uh, walking over uh, along a lot of terrain. You know, so it's, it is very physically demanding work. And so that's why they wanna get us moved up into that category because it's not real likely that you're going to have people working in EMS, especially from a full-time standpoint, full-time employment at the age of 65 or later. Did she happen to give you the number of workers who are in the currently in the retirement system now? So, for example, is there 500 across the state that are actually active in the retirement system? Did she have that number? As far as EMS goes, yeah, uh, there there were some numbers in her letter. I don't have those in front of me. She had okay. broken that down, but uh, I believe that it was something like almost 25 percent of EMS workers in the state of South Dakota are eligible for South Dakota retirement or, or contribute to it but I don't know what the exact number is. Well, uh, <clears throat> I agree with Dan that we need to, to support this. Uh, uh, the, the, the 300 pounds is one thing, but dealing with many of the metal and, and physical incapacities that your clients have, it, it's, it's hard on the mind, I believe. So yeah, I would move that we issue a letter recommending approval of this. I'll second that motion. That we support it. We support it. Yes. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, and, and also, I appreciate the fact that they work. Work at work. <laughs> okay. We'll get that. Okay. We'll get that signed and okay. Thank you, Troy. With that, we go to item seven pictometry. Jessica, come on forward. I figured while I was here, um, I wanted to tell you just a little update about what the Equalization Office has been doing this summer. So we are working on, last year it was approved that we could do a leased site layer for our website. Um, and so that's what we're working on right now is, and we're, we're finishing it up right now um, to get that over to District 3. They're gonna be creating a layer for us. So when you, a search a lease site right now in the county on the website you can't visually see it uh, this is going to allow you to visually see it so we've been going out to um, just under a thousand parcels with uh, just over 700 of those being mobile homes 
and just mapping out the courts, making sure we have all the right mobile homes where they're supposed to be, um, viewing them, measuring them, doing all that fun stuff. So for pictometry, we met with them, with the city as well, um, who's here tonight too. And this is a new contract for the next three years. Um, the flyover is scheduled for next year. And after talking to them and adjusting the contract a little bit, and they've had some better rates as well, we were able to bring that cost down. Um, so the previous cycle, the total was um, 89264 and the quote for this round is $67,080. Um, that is split between us and the city. And the city's portion, over the three years, it's billed once a year, so it's divided by three. Um, theirs totals 20,000, and our portion for the county totals 47,800. Can you explain to the public what you do with this information once you get it? Sure. Uh, this is connected to our website, um, and we also have it internally. And it is um, a much better imagery of the county and the structures within the county. So most, well, I won't say most because I don't, I can't really. What do we have now? We have pictometry. We have Eagle View. We have the same Yep. Thing. Yep. So You're we've already just upgrading. Done. Well, this is just a new. So every flyover requires a new contract. Yeah. So we're just renewing the contract. Um, otherwise, we would have, I think it's whatever the FSA has or Google. So it's a much blurrier um, image. And this way, we're able to get much better details. The details in the city, they, they do, um, they pay for a better image. Uh, but our image is pretty impressive in the county too. So it, it greatly benefits the equalization office, the city, I would assume the zoning office. Um, we all utilize it and it's significantly better than the alternative. And it's a lot cheaper. Yes, yeah, around. the cost came down quite a bit. So that was, that was great news. Any questions for Jessica? Otherwise, we look for a motion to approve. The is, is it in your budget this year? Uh, this one actually, I believe, comes out of data. Um, I mean, if we want to add it to that budget line, I'd be happy to do it, but I think it comes out of data. So that that's a yes, it is in your budget. No, it's out of the. It's, it's in, in the in, budget. It's, it's, in, a, yeah. it's in the budget. It's in the budget. Okay. Yeah. Not directly out of my a budget. but a budget. Yeah. Okay. For more, so it would be budgeted for, I would assume the eighty nine thousand, which will drop that. So, right, the county will get some money back. So get the. So I would move to approve the contract with Eagle View? Yes. Is that what it's called? Eagle View for flyover to be done in 2023. Second. Motion and a second, further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Okay, item eight, we're a little behind schedule, but uh, United today, stronger tomorrow, come on forward. Do you need a projector or anything? No, I should be good. Okay. Well, first off, howdy, commissioners. Thank you so much. And for... speak into the microphone. Oh, yep, we'll do. I'll do that. Better? Yes. All right. Sounds good. So first off, I want to appreciate you guys for letting me speak today. Uh, Patty, I know I've also talked to you a couple times on the phone. Thank you for your help. And then Dan, we've met with you before as well, too. So my name is Ruben Englehart. I am the community organizer for United States Stronger Tomorrow. I work primarily and, and pretty much exclusively here in South Dakota across the state on a variety of issues. And one of the ones that we've been working on over the last eight months, um, and now specifically in Yankton County's American Rescue Plan funds. Um, so we have been working on the state 
or the uh, past legislature in the last few weeks, we started working in Yankton County in order to start speaking to some of the community members on how they'd like to see these funds implemented and even talking to them about the concerns they might be having. Um, we did that survey through peer-to-peer -peer texting and we got 182 surveys, so nearly 1% of Yankton County. And through that, we found top three issues, the top three issues that we found were of course infrastructure, roads in South Dakota will always be a main priority. Uh, Slow down speed racing. He's got 10 minutes, so he's... <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Next up was family support with child care and elder care subsidies, and then health care was cost of mental health. And this was just given in a very broad approach. So we weren't, we don't have an agenda. We're just allowing people to express their concerns in this manner. So today, um, through some of those conversations and through some meetings that we've been having in Yankton County, you'll be hearing from some community members on some of the issues they're seeing, how they'd like to see American Rescue Plan funds implemented, and uh, some of them have questions for you. So again, thank you guys for letting us speak today, and I'll hand it off to community members. And they're tagging off. <laughs> That's right. It's adjustable. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Michelle here from here in Yankton. Thank you for listening to us. And thank you to Commissioner Clemish for having a discussion with us earlier. So we have a little bit idea what's been going on with the county funds. Uh, my unique perspective is that I got COVID on March 27, 2020. So uh, two years, four months, six days ago, I, I am a long hauler. So I have the unique, um, as an advocate, I'm actually a South Dakota advocate with the National Long Hauler Advocacy Project. So what I'm seeing is some things that, yeah, that'll be mirrored here again tonight are, uh, as we're becoming homeless, as we are struggling with thousands of dollars of medical bills and no treatment and mental health issues. And just me personally having to leave my job, having to take time off from my job, having to find a different job to be at home, that there's, there's just been, I would, I would just kind of sum it all up as crisis. There's just been a lot of crisis. And I would sum up the ARPA funds as, as COVID relief funds are kind of the way that, that they were sold. And uh, as I have talked to the state and to the city, we just haven't seen a lot of COVID relief, you know, for a long hauler, we haven't seen any COVID relief out of this. And I get that um, there's discussions yet on the remaining funds of going for roads and we always need roads. And uh, you'll hear some other crisis, mental health, other things that are coming up. And those are, those are all important. I would just ask that the remaining funds be um, considered for things other than roads. I know roads are kind of cheaper now with, with, the, with the gas price locked in for a little while, but um, there's several other needs in the community and in the county as well. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Right Thank you. Thanks. No, can you, ma'am, Michelle, correct? Yes. Would you mind stating your last name so we can put it in the record? Carlson. Carlson. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Robin Novotny. I live here in Yankton and I'm here with UTST today too. Um, I definitely agree with everything that Michelle just said. Uh, I don't really have anything to add to that. I do have a few questions that we we're curious about. Do you guys have any idea when the commissioners will be making a decision on the remainder of the ARP funds? I don't know that we have every you know, a set timeline for every penny to be spent um, other than the deadline of what, 2020? Has to be committed by 2025, 2024, and spent by 2026. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, my other question is, do you guys have, you the commissioners, do you have any plans for public engagement to get the community more involved in <clears throat> excuse me, how to, you know, allocate the funds? Well, if I could speak to that, I think we have meetings two times a month, every month, and folks can come and make public comment twice during every meeting if they have something they'd like to share. I mean, I don't know that we've got a meeting per se where we're going to discuss ARPA funds, at least I'm unaware of it, if there is one. Just know personally, I uh, wasn't even aware that we could comment on the funds until uh, Ruben contacted me with UTST and the survey. So I think maybe there's uh, people in the community don't really know that they could have a say. 
well, I don't know that it's have a say per se, but it's, I mean, they yeah. can come in and make recommendations or speak during public comment. Okay. And I guess that I'd add just people at home and everybody here, um, we can all be reached by email and typically by phone as well on any issues throughout the year. So, and I'd, I'd echo that with, with Joe, you know, we appreciate this is really the first time anybody has come with us with any type of suggestions. And for the last four or five years, we've heard roads and bridges, our infrastructure is falling apart. What do we do? And it's probably go back to 20, 30 years. And so we earmarked a lot of this funding for the problems that we have, you know, we could go on for a long time. Counties are chronically under funded and we got four bridges over the James River. One of them were getting replaced, but um, they're 70 years old. They're ending their useful life and our roads are not in the best shape. And so we decided we're, we had something to do. We're gonna do something about it. And so that's what we did because we have been getting public input on that for years. Um, not all of it spent, but I do appreciate you guys coming in. This is really the first time anybody's addressed us on that. So yeah. and, and absence of any feedback, where we're going with the feedback that we had gotten from years prior. So I appreciate that. Thank were you. The, um, one quick question for that. Were yes, the funds earmarked for COVID specifically, or was it something like a general fund that could be like just to know up to $10 million mm -hmm. can be spent on whatever we have the authority to spend it on? Okay. So we could buy gold carpet for our, if we wanted to, as an example, not the wisest choice, but we, we could do that type of thing with it. Okay. So they changed the rules toward the end. Sure. Some think, within our departments have been um, specifically to COVID, to uh, EMS and to different department <clears throat> needs and whatnot as well. Some building upgrades and some work at the prison and so some that's where some of those funds have gone as well. Okay, that's good to I, know. I think most, yeah. most of the uh, expenditures of the county are, are kind of controlled by an annual budget mm -hmm. that we meet, which is an open forum to anybody that wants to be here. And uh, that's where we, we gain our direction and perspective on where we, the county wants to go. And that's what we try to do. Yes. Okay, I think that is everything. Um, I had to say thank you for letting us be here and for talking and for having some input. And I'll turn it over to Jared. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just going to, I don't want to discourage anyone. I just want to try to keep a little bit to schedule. Yeah, I'll go quickly. Thank you. Uh, but not too quickly. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jared Holcomb. I live here in Yankton. I'm a member of UTST as well. Uh, thank you for all of your time. Uh, so I, I just want to lend my support to my colleagues here. I didn't want to bring more stuff, but uh, I wanted to ask how we can stay a part of this conversation and potentially help you guys decide what you're going to do with that money. Uh, I know we do have more infrastructure money coming to the county soon, right? Uh, we, we hope. I don't think anything is guaranteed for infrastructure funds that I'm aware of. Unless no, we've else not knows. received any word no. that we are approved for anything. Okay. Uh, well, then... Is there a way that we could easily stay part of this conversation? Do uh, you have any suggestions? I think we put out a, uh, an agenda uh, every two weeks. Just we keep checking meeting. the website and coming yeah, to the meetings. Keep, keep track of what's on the agenda. And we have right. uh, we're, our budget, our annual budget is going to be published the 19th in the newspaper. Is that correct? And, and then our August 19th. And then we're having our budget hearing, which is an open meeting. Anybody can come to it on September 6th, and then we approve the budget on September 20th. And those are all hearings open to the public. Anybody can come speak on it. Okay. I, I would suggest being proactive and putting a proposal of what, where your needs are that you see and what you might want um, and get that to us that we can go through. And we might say, let's spend it all there. We might say, well, that would be good. Maybe not that, but at least then we have a discussion Right. Of where, where that need might be. Okay. So uh, that's pretty much all I had. Uh, thank you. And I, I would like to urge again that just try and keep the community involved with these decisions with this money. Thank you. Thank you.
My name is Anna Meredith. Um, I am a long time Yankton resident, and I also serve as the Education and Survivor Services Supervisor for River City Domestic Violence Center right here in Yankton. Um, so thank you, allow, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, there is an invisible portion of the population in Yankton who have unmet mental and physical health needs, substance addictions, and their basic needs are just not being fulfilled. I am so grateful to those who have spoken before me this evening um, and after to highlight some of these needs. I would like to elaborate a little bit more on other concerns that our agency has observed. So while we understand there are limited funds available and often these funds go toward more tangible infrastructures, which we all know that we need and are very important, we hope the commission recognizes the need to invest in human infrastructure. River City Domestic Violence Center has been combating violence in the Yankton area for nearly 50 years. We provide a safe haven to survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, stalking, and child abuse. River City exists to break the cycle of these traumas in our community through survivor empowerment, advocacy, education, awareness, and social change. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our team worked diligently, diligently to spread awareness so survivors knew we were still here and we were willing to assist. With awareness and empowerment, of course, comes an increase in survivors seeking services and the need for more space. Already this year, Emergency Shelter has provided 1,341 shelter nights. This year alone, 47 adult survivors and 37 secondary survivors, their children, have felt unsafe in our community or surrounding communities as we help the more rural areas as well and sought out our emergency shelter. Our team has worked with nearly 150 survivors already this year just in our community. River City Domestic Violence Center also provides services to survivors that are maybe not in need of emergency shelter such as um, but we also, we can work with them if they don't necessarily need a safe haven. We can provide other services um, such as housing relocation, safety planning, uh, assisting in filing a protection order, accompaniment to court or medical exams, such as a sexual assault nurse examination. So even before the pandemic, River City Domestic Violence Center had identified a significant need for additional non-congregate housing due to the increasingly complex set of issues faced by individuals seeking shelter from violence and abuse, as well as the increase in need to assist male victims of domestic violence. Our experience during the pandemic made this even more critical. Currently, we have four separate sleeping areas that can house up to six people each, which is typically a mother and her children. Those sleeping areas then share a large kitchen, common area, and laundry facility. We also have extremely, extremely limited space for staff to work and no real conference area available at this time um, for personal one-on-one -on -one meetings with victims. Social distancing is therefore almost impossible within our shelter currently. We are proposing to add four new non codrigant units on the south side of the facility to house victims of violence. Those units will include a small kitchenette, a table, and beds in each room. The units will be of various sizes, some of which can accommodate a victim and several children. Additionally, there'll be a shared laundry room available. The four ADA, ADA accessible conjugate rooms will be retained. Although our design plans are not finalized, we are working with puts designed from Mitchell and have tentatively decided to construct a two-story addition on the south end of the facility. Um, River City Domestic Violence Center already owns this land. All utilities are already available at the site and it is zoned appropriately. We do not anticipate any issues with this expansion. Now we are just in need of funding for this project. In the past year, River City has reserved and paid for over 160 hotel rooms at an average cost of $70 per night. Uh, we must use these emergency services allotted monies to house victims in hotels. And last year, 40% of this allocation was used just for hotel rooms. Uh, we are so very grateful to be in the Yankton area and to meet the needs of survivors and our family. However, the lack of space is currently making it extremely difficult to continue to provide all these services to these survivors. 
trying to accommodate for a lack of office and shelter space has caused financial burden, which could be alleviated by this expansion. We appreciate your time this evening and your consideration. Any questions for me? Where is the domestic, is it by where the visitation center is? Yeah, yeah, that's our sister agency. Um, and so that would also impact um, River City Family Connections as well, um, as the expansion would provide more room for those um, supervised so, visits as well. So you would, the plan is to add to the south? Yes. Yep. Two stories. Yes, I believe that is the plan. And I do have um, kind of what this looks like now, if you if interested in passing it down the line. And this is the um, kind of what we're proposing at this point and what's kind of been worked up um, with the company that is assisting. And when you say you <coughs> excuse me, take in survivors, um, isn't it in fact true that if I were to call 911 and let's say Mr. Kettering were beating me and I were to call 911, <laughs> um, law enforcement would take one of us away? leaving one of us still in the home. Typically, um, you know, that can happen. Well, um, that is the law. It, yes, and if someone is arrested, now if a survivor is left in a home, um, they're, you know, once that other individual is released, part of their bond is typically a no contact. Um, that is not always followed, unfortunately, by offenders. And they're still leaving those survivors at a vulnerable state within their home or, Another example, if they were not able to work and they were you know, financially dependent on that individual, then they cannot afford their housing at that point. And that is where we're able to step in, keep them safe while we then find affordable housing for them. Isn't it true that in a domestic violence situation, Native American women take 21 times assaults or calls to law enforcement before they leave and Caucasians take 16? I would say on average, it's about seven, really depending on the, you know, the situation. Somebody could be in an incident where something happened once and they leave. Another time it could be up to 16 don't times until they leave. Don't national statistics bear out 16 and 21? I believe it's seven times, unless that has since changed. And when you say that sometimes they don't, when law, anytime law enforcement is called, one mm -hmm. of those two people is going yes. to jail. If they, you know, show up and they can, they decide at that point that they can find that predominant, predominant aggressor, they will, you know, then make they that random, arrest. They randomly pick one of the two. I, what we've been I'm somewhat gonna... seeing is that they will file charges over to the state's attorney to see if there's necessary charges that need to be made. Um, but typically there is an arrest made um, once they do their investigation. So in the manner of time, we're a little off topic of the COVID funds. <laughs> yes. But um, do you have any more to? No, I do not. Nope, okay. that is it for me. With that, so. I would encourage you next. Okay, thank you. My name's Jim Kerr. I've been a practicing physician in this community for over 38 years. And uh, I've been asked to give some perspective uh, to the UTST group in terms of COVID and how it affects us and what's going on and where, where are we right now. With COVID, <clears throat> I admitted uh, one COVID patient two days ago and treated another one and sent them home. Our, our elderly are still quite a bit at risk for the Omicron variant the BA5 variant, and uh, it's true, it's not causing as many hospitalizations. Um, we started this whole mess uh, December, 2019. Then we had the Delta variant, then we had the Omicron. Most of the symptoms for Omicron are uh, sore throat, uh, headache, uh, some have nausea. There's almost always dehydration and fever and a cough, which is persistent and tickle for three weeks. Um, if they don't have shortness of breath associated, whether they have asthma or not, doesn't really affect that. It's a diffusion problem in the lungs. It isn't a bronchospasm problem. So we treat accordingly and usually with steroids and zinc. And those are the things we can use because the monoclonal antibodies that are available for the previous variants don't seem to affect Omicron very well. And they're very expensive to administer sometimes 
two in a package, uh, you infuse over an hour and it's not working. So we don't use those anymore, but we do support pulmonary uh, treatment in, in the hospitals. Fortunately, the BA5 is not nearly as dangerous, especially since a large portion of the population now has vaccine and boosters, which is two or three vaccines and two or three boosters. So for the people we're seeing with the vaccines and the boosters, those people are usually in the hospital for a couple of days. They get their breathing straightened out, they go home. And if they have further problems, we can take them back in. Very few are, are critical pulmonary transfers. But the problems we were having during the height of COVID, even as, as um, late as three months ago, was that we couldn't get beds. So you'd have pulmonary critical care specialists that could take these patients in major centers like Sioux Falls or Sioux City, and we couldn't transfer them there because they didn't have a bed available. It also put everything else on hold if you have a heart attack or you have a stroke. We can't transfer those patients because we don't have beds. So that has gone down tremendously in the past month and a half, two months. And now we're getting our transfers out appropriately. We're flying people where they need to go. And I'm very happy about that. But just so you know, this is not out of the park yet, but it's a whole lot better. So we're hoping that the people who have had vaccination and who've had boosters will do, continue to do well. The children tend to do well, whether they've been vaccinated or not. I know that's been a reason a lot of people haven't gotten vaccinated. And I think, well, that's an individual and personal decision, which I don't argue with. I treat people when they come to me. And, but the other thing that's happened is there used to be a big flap about uh, whether you're gonna use ivermectin or whether you didn't and so forth. And now we don't have to because the replication phase of the virus is limited by the fact that the people are already partially immunized. So anyway, that's where it's at. Our first Omicron variant was November of the 20, 2021 in South Africa. And since then it's made it here. We have several subvariants now available, but none of them are major players on the stage. So the BA5 is the only one we have. And it's a nuisance and it's not fun. And I personally contracted it three weeks ago and ran the course of seven days and it's a nuisance, that's all, but fortunately not a big problem. You may also with this disease have some problems with being in the presence of other people who have the virus and are shedding virus in the same room. You may get weak legs, you may start to tickle cough yourself again, or headache or runny nose. And that's your body defense system trying to get rid of this before you even get it again. And that's how, how this uh, illness works, which is slightly different than anything we've had with influenza uh, or the other treatable contagious diseases. So I just wanted to give you a perspective of what we're seeing and what we could expect. I'm sure there'll be other subvariants, and we may have, I won't say we may have, I am certain we're going to have another vaccination in the fall for Omicron. If we don't get another subvariant that becomes dominant, Pfizer and Moderna are both working on those right now and they've got them to phase two trials and so they'll be out and you'll be expected to consider them. <laughs> so in the, in the last 90 days since it kind of broke and it's gone it's down. It's really, really going down in terms of the frequency and the severity of the illness that present through the emergency services and to hospitals in general. So for hospitals and emergency services, What's the percentage of those that have been in that category that have had their vaccinations? It's very high. It's, it's over 80%. 80% have had their vaccinations. Yeah. yeah. And the ones that were at risk uh, for the past uh, two months have been um, mentally retarded or disabled patients that have been locked up this whole time for two years and really hadn't come out much. And now they get exposed to it. And of the geriatric group, which I'm now a member. I'm informed by my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and there are a lot of people that, that didn't want the vaccination. Many of the people that weren't aware that they uh, had had COVID have actually had it. And that's why the second case and the third case is just not as eventful. And that's just great. And I think you can get immunization or you can get the virus and either way you're gonna have active. But what they did say in the readings and the abstracts recently is that 
Just because you've had Omicron BA5 does not mean that you're going to be extremely resistant to the next Omicron variant, which I think means, okay, we're gonna see this over and over like colds, like right. influenza. It's just gonna be with us. And I, don't, I can't say how long I'm as tired of it as everybody else, because I treat it daily. I'm gonna cut you off there. That's, that's fine, okay. I'm done. And is there anybody else? I think we'll, if we can do about a two, three minute wrap up would be, Come on up. Perfect. I, I know we went a little over time there. I do appreciate you guys' patience and listening to us today. Um, so just last thing to wrap things up, it seems that uh, pretty open to bringing a proposal on, on the remainder of American Rescue Plan funds and some of the issues we're seeing. Just continue, continue this conversation to uh, the next meeting in two weeks and kind of going from there. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? What I would probably suggest is, is to, to group formulate Mm -hmm. what you would like to spend specific items and essentially submit a budget request to to uh, patty that she can forward on to us or just to everybody your email sure and um and then we can pick that up and go i don't know if we'll have a specific meeting toward if we'll discuss it during budget hearing okay. but um, we can try to let you you know either contact you and get you on the agenda yeah. or um, just let you know to come to the budget or either way, but get something for us to review with specifics. Of course. Yeah. It's just, yeah, totally hear you there. And then reaching out to Patty with the, the form on that one, I'm assuming. Okay, definitely. We'll do. I, I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm being 701. Uh, entertain a motion to go into board of adjustment second into a board of adjustment my microphone wasn't on sorry second further discussion all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. any opposed motion passes we are now on board of adjustment item nine i'm going to mess this up first conditional use the toxic tie check there you go come on forward sir Good evening, Keith Totrick, 263 Neast, Yankton. I'm proposing to add on to a building that I have out at my house. I've got a machine shed back up in the hills and like all machine sheds, when you build it, it's already too small. And I wanna add on a 2000 square foot building onto, onto the existing structure. I'm gonna put up a James Steel building and attach it right to my existing building and it's for cold storage for putting equipment and getting a lot of my stuff out of the elements in the sun and just clean the place up it's, would it would it be fair that it won't bother your neighbors because you virtually have no neighbors well it would be fair to say and you can't see this this building site from any road anywhere only when you fly over or google earth so it's uh, and my neighbors are all for it anyhow. So being as I plow their snow, they're pretty cooperative. <laughs> that makes a good neighbor right there. <laughs> What's the sidewall height on that? I... The sidewall is going to be 14. Okay. The existing is 16. Is the little building that sits to the northwest just a little building or is that a home? No, that's a little building. That's actually a boiler room for my wood-fired boiler that heats, mm, nice. that heats the whole system. Gotcha. because I'm surrounded by wood. <laughs> I hear you. I don't have any questions. I asked mine. Okay. You're welcome to have a seat. I'll open up to public comment and okay. we'll proceed. Anybody in the audience care to make public comment on this application? Hearing and seeing none, public comment is closed. I'll bring it back to the board for discussion and decision. Do you want me to walk through? Finance? Yeah, well, or would you? I can run through them quickly. Okay. So, findings of fact from planning and zoning um, applicants request conditional use for addition of accessory structure. It's over 2,400 square feet per Article 7, Section 707. Would like to add an additional 2,000 square feet to an existing 4,400 square foot building. Publishings and mailings were out. Um, the Planning Commission recommendation was to grant. Um, 
ingress egress exists this uh, off right away parking exists refuge is there utilities are there screenings there no signs required um, yards required yards are present and it's in general compatibility with the adjacent properties and i didn't catch 50 i believe yep move approval second further discussion all those uh roll call vote please patty yeah. yes yes joe yes Rhonda. yes Don. yes Motion passes. And we'll move right into um, Pugsley conditional use permit, please. Item 10. A bit more information than what you guys are packing up this page. This is an actual drawing of the actual building. Apparently, it's only where good dogs go. I'm Dennis Michael, 30428 437th Avenue. Uh, Colin is my son in law. He's someplace between London, Wales, or Ireland right now. They're on vacation. So I'm here to speak on this. The, um, they want, uh, Colin is. Uh, my daughters, they moved back from Rapid City to Yankton. Uh, she starts in the school system as a speech therapist for Yankton School District this coming term. And Colin is, um, wants to uh, build this kennel or put this kennel up to be able to board and house dogs there uh, for different people and then provide some training. He's a avid bird dog hunter. And I think in the Yankton community from the People that I've talked to and some of the front, my friends that there's still a need for more housing for people's pets. Um, that's what he's intending on doing. And um, the card that I stapled to the front of it, I've got, I've got horse heart ahead of the card here a little bit, but that's actually their two dogs that's in the picture on the front there. He, she has a Aussie and he has a Munsterlander dog. So what? What is the Munsterlander? Never heard of it. But anyway, the, the building site um, on my, the farm um, will be uh, right down the driveway coming into the farmstead. I think uh, Bill sent that to you on your packet. There's a big grain bin right there. It's gonna be just to the north and west of that a little bit. Uh, this building plan that I showed you, it'll be able to house 12 dogs. Um, there's a, the building is a prefab building that comes in. Uh, it's manufactured in Pennsylvania and comes in and it's all real easy to keep sanitary and stuff on the inside and wash. You'll have in the, the south end of the building, this building, the way it's sitting, the long way north and south is where it'll sit and the office will be to the south end. Um, and then in each kennel, there's a basically a, a, a night place or a feeding area for the dog that they'll be in. And then there's just a little run that's attached to that so they have some more room in their pen than that. But then also outside of the building, there is going to put a, a fenced in um, run outside of the building so they can take the dogs out one-on-one -on -one and exercise them and, and do things outside. The only time that any dog will ever leave the structure or that pen, they will be on a leash, um, take them outside and do some one-on-one -on -one training with them or something like that. But um, he's putting, uh, wanting to put satellite camera or satellite security system in there that that will go to his phone so if there's an issue or a problem or somebody drives in that's not supposed to be there or whatever that will be be monitored 24 7. Um, utilities are all right there it's just a matter of hooking into them um, dad prepares the site <laughs> um, i see that you have a drain stub so i'm assuming every kennel has its own little drain right and then does that drain into like a septic tank there'll be a septic system um most of the pens will be cleaned by hand all the time but there is a flush wash system that goes out and we'll be putting a small septic system in outside um he's wanting to use a um, collection system and to be able to have like a 
garbage service pickup for the feed bags and that kind of stuff. Um, we're deciding what to do. He could, they will also take the waste from the building itself, but because I run a cattle feedlot there, there's always more. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's a issue and that's why I wanted to put the building where the location is now. It's away from down in the yard where I still operate okay. and keep the, and the customers and stuff. Um, he's thinking about adding, we've discussed this quite a bit, um, a pickup service. Because a lot, you know, because we're out in the country and then people on weekends and stuff that he might set some points like in Yankton or surrounding areas. to. So they go pick them up. Yeah, he will bring the dog yeah. and take it out there and then meet you back there. You know, they're going to, he's thinking about a, you know, some kind of a schedule thing to work it out so that like people that come want to go down to the lake and don't want their dog with them that weekend or going to be out of town or something like that, but don't have the time to come out to have some kind of a service where you can go out and actually pick the dog up. Um, like I say, we're pretty remote. It's protected from the, on the west and the south, or the west and the north from a big shelter belt that's there. Um, and it's pretty well isolated, not even behind the grain bin and stuff like that. We'll build a little bit better road that goes in around it so there'll be definite parking for the thing. He'll be looking at some type of signage to put up um, and we'll have to come, of course, into the board to get that approved, but uh, so that people can find it off the road. It's on highway on the county road 304, the asphalt road, and probably I own the property clear to the road, so he can put a sign up on the corner right there to turn here <laughs> thing, and it's the first place there. So, um, where do the bad dogs go? <laughs> He's kind of because apparently he, only the good dogs go. To well, I know, but he's he's a he's a pretty aggressive about obedience, and that's one of his his two things that he's looking at trading is the one basic obedience, you know, for young dogs and stuff like that, and then bird dog training. That's where his his specialty is right now. It's going here by your grain bin. You're saying is that yeah. okay? Oh, so a good good place with the yeah. shelter belt and. And it like yeah. I say, uh, you know, there was a little, you know, I we were concerned about people being concerned about dogs barking, but mm -hmm. where it's at, the sound's not going to get out of there. Um, and I don't yeah. think, you know, my closest neighbors across the road, less than a quarter mile away, and and uh, but they, I hear their dogs bark all the time. But this is pretty protected. Uh, um, there's another house on the site right there, close to where the kids at some point in their life will be moving into. But mm -hmm. um, for right now, they they have a house they have a house they purchased here in Yankton right by Webster School so um but he'll be going back and forth and then uh all the time and with the security cameras and stuff and and there so very nice uh drawings and depictions it's, it's I a, appreciate you doing that the but... building if you um you can go to their website everything mm -hmm. is basically spray coated with an epoxy on the inside so mm -hmm. when it's white it washes down um, there'll be windows in there. Um, it's well insulated, um, heated, air conditioned. So it's a pretty good setup for dog. It's a, excuse me, it's a pig barn, a mobile pig barn that came in, but they're housing dogs. <laughs> but that's the company that's out there. And I can't think of the name of the company. It's probably on the sheet or someplace, but that's what they specialize in. They build all different sizes. This is about one of the bigger ones. The rising structures. Right. From that I could see. Okay. Any and further questions? Oh, sorry. Metal, metal roof, um, the siding and stuff like that. It's, you know, it, that information is all on your, on your sheet here that they sent us here this last week. So any questions? Thank you, Dan. Go ahead and have a seat and we'll open up for public comment. Anybody in the audience care to make a public comment at this time? Hearing and seeing none, public comment is closed. We'll bring it back to the board. Do you want to walk through? Yep, I will uh, go through this the right page. Okay, the requirements of 1723 have been met um, and 1729 have been met. 
requesting conditional use uh, permit for a kennel dog boarding facility with less than 20 dogs in the egg district for section 507 mails mailings went out and publishings were put out uh, as four zero to grant the conditional use ingress egress exists this, uh, off right away parking exists refuge exists utilities present screening present um, signage will be uh, follow the signage ordinance required yards are present it is in general compatibility with adjacent properties and will not adversely affect the public interest that i'd entertain a motion i'll Thank move you. approval of the request second motion in a second further discussion roll call vote please John. yes Dan. yes Wanda. yes Sherry. yes Yes. Motion passes. The only comment I was going to make is in the minutes for that meeting, you are marked as voting yes, although it says you're abstaining. So you might want to uncheck that box oh, in the minutes. I so, saw abstain. I didn't look at that. Yeah, it, it was checked. Okay. So make a motion to come out of executive session. Second. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Further discussion? to come out of executive session or a board of adjustment board of adjustment into all, regular section into regular session all those in favor say aye. Aye. aye aye any opposed motion passes we are now in regular session so we have a first reading for uh mr paulson applicants requesting your microphone's not on There you go. Applicants requesting to rezone the following properties from moderate density, density R2 to Ag Agricultural District A AG per Article 18, Section 1809 and Article 20, Section 2003. Said properties are legally described as Plat of Paulson Homestead in the northwest quarter of the southwest quarter and in that portion of the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter lying west of South Dakota Highway 52 in Section 14, Township 93 North, Range 57 West of the 5th Principal Meridian, Yankton County, South Dakota, and the northwest of the southwest quarter of Section 14 and the northeast quarter of the southeast quarter of Section 15, all in Township 93 North, Range 57 West of the 5th Principal Meridian, Yankton County, South Dakota, E911 address is 43159 South Dakota Highway 52, Yankton, South Dakota. And this is adjacent to Egg in the north. Okay. So, first reading of the rezone. Uh, is there any questions or discussion here? would open it up to public comment. If anyone would like to make a public comment on this uh, rezone application. Hearing and seeing none, public comment is closed. And if there's no comments or discussion here, we will reconvene for the second reading on the 16th, 16th? August 16th. Sound right, Gary? That will go to item 12, July 2022 payroll. Move, Move approval. Second. second. Motion is second. Further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. I have a question on the claims. On page three of 29. I thought when we approved the new public defender contract um, that it was 12,000 to Mr. Horn's office and 2,500 to each of the other two. I would so, admit. so I don't know if this is in addition to something else or if it's 
vouchered separately or how it's vouchered, but it's not very telling. I would assume those are additional over and above their contract requirements. Yeah, because that's what it is. So if you added those up, I believe it's $3,126 above contract for those three. So I assume they were assigned other cases. And I thought they were going to voucher them separately because they were supposed to get X number of dollars for doing all of a certain thing. And then anything else would be an addition. You want those split out, yeah. Well, so it would make sense. That's, yeah, I was gonna say, we can just ask Cassie to do that in the future. Because I think, I I'll, think- I'll look at the voucher and let you know, Wanda, how it is. Because I, I think Judge Gehring is under the impression that they are to get all things above, um, like all Outside the- Outside of the contract or the- Yes. Do you wanna leave that one off and approve it at next meeting? Oh, I. I just want to know because if the I'll next time you, it comes around, we're. I'll let you know one and then I'll make sure it's separated or let Cassie know. Would you go ahead and email that, that out to all the commissioners, Patty? I, I will. Thank you. So I would move approval of the claims. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, item 13, June 30th, budget meeting minutes. Move approval. Wait a second here. Um, I've got some, this is for the August 10th. Let's see, where are my notes? Let me pull those up. There's a couple of things. Uh, June 30th? I'm sorry. Yeah, June we 30th budget meeting. So in the initial paragraph, it should be the meeting was called to order by Vice Chair Sherry Lost, not Joe Healy. Um, item 22279C should be 7.40 a.m. It says p.m. And then toward the very end, it should say, instead of Chairman Healy, close public comment, Vice Chair Lost. So with those corrections, go ahead and make your motion. With Ms. Lowe's corrections, I would move to approve those minutes. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Now on to July 19th meeting minutes. Move approval. And I should have abstained from that, sorry. Abstain from the June 30th vote, <laughs> Patty. Too late now. Get, in the, ha get in the habit of. So I'd move approval on July 19th. Second. Further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item 14 County Poor Relief Guidelines. Do we have those in the packet or are they printed out? I will have to send that to you. Okay. So if you look in the, so in the, in the last, last packet, packet, I'm looking for it. Yep, it should be in the last packet. We did just some typo things that we found. Um, sure. I don't mm -hmm. have that packet. It would be July. Uh, let's see. Oh, you what mean from, been? Never mind. Correct. Is it July 19? Okay. Gotcha. I'm not finding it. No. I guess I'd so still like to see a, 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 the finished. It's copy. not on the auditors. I think at the, at the last meeting when we discussed it, everyone was supposed to get their comments to the state's attorney's office for mm -hmm. feedback at this meeting. I'm assuming everybody did that. I know I sent them a few questions and about what we were required. Some of those things were we were required to do. I think it was two meetings ago. Was I don't think meetings? it was the, the 19th. If I remember right, it was. 
July 5th. Probably the yep, July, July 5th. 5th at the very bottom. It's state's attorneys, item number 14. There we go. So those are both we there. We gave two meetings or two weeks, there we four go. weeks to. Yeah, so if you didn't get your, get those, yeah. if you didn't get your comments, now is the time to share them because it's been a month. Oh. So what? What has been I'm, added to it since this? Nothing, nothing was problem. added. We just fixed, we found spelling A couple errors. errors or grammatical. Okay. Yep. Right. So I think oh, what, I thought it looked good. well, what the state's attorney's office is hoping is that at the next meeting, we can present what would be a final copy for approval. Uh, under definitions, did you catch the definitions under, uh, under, depos ugh, under definitions on applicant? SDLCL? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So it was things like that that we fixed. That we fixed. Okay. So uh, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you guys. Patty okay. can send it out. Um, as Sherry said, we'd like to then Get approve it. the final at the next commission meeting. So if you have anything. Um, we did get comment from Troy Thurman Contact Center because we did include information about those services. Um, but unlike other counties, we don't actually have anything to do with those. So we're providing the information in our guidelines in the so people know about them. So that was one thing that we kind of were looking for feedback on, do you want that information in there? Troy was fine with it, but he said it, it's certainly okay if we take it out as well. Um, we try to make it clear that those, those aren't things that the county provides, that that's through the contact center, so. And we don't have a policy like this currently, so that's why we're grading We this. have a very, mm -hmm. Old one, okay. correct. Do most, I know some counties do, but does not every county has this? No, I would okay. say almost so, every county has their guidelines. guidelines. It's just whether or not some of them, uh, things that the contact center does, like the uh, rent reimbursement, those types of things actually goes through the county employee who does that, we don't do that. So um, it's kind of up to the commission. Do you want to include that information or not include it? Is that something required by the county? No. So others are doing that, but that's correct. They basically I think they their person just oversees it. Sure. And in our case, we have the contact center that does it. So So please email me if you catch anything and want anything changed. Thank you. So if you have any dire concerns, the state's attorney's office needs to know within the next week. Yep. Concerns so or dire concerns? Well, any well concerns, dire concerns too, um, so that they can prepare and be ready for the next meeting. And then moving on to the medical assistance application. That's in the same. That's not in here either. So same, same. Yep. Patty will send the updated. Same group. Again, yep. no changes from the last time, just fixed. Just some, yeah. Things that we found that were incorrect. And again, um, that's all through the state as far as what is required um, to be in the application. Okay. So for both of those, we will expect a vote at uh, the next meeting. With that, we're gonna move to item 15, public comment. Would anybody care to make a public comment at this time? Close it quick. Hearing and seeing non-public comment is closed. 
Uh, commissioner updates. So uh, I just have one thing. August 10th at 11 o'clock, we have we will have a special meeting for the rural access infrastructure. And I think I sent all the information out to everybody that came down from the state. It's been sent out to the township boards. So they have what the application looks like. The reason we need to meet in August is the deadline for the township's five-year plan is August 31st. And so- So what time was that? 11 o'clock. Okay. So my goal with trying to get that early in August is to give them some comfort level going forward. Um, and we're all using the forms in the same manner. So there's some <laughs> consistency. And the number that we received and Patty confirmed we got the payment was 285,000 or so. Um, so all of that money is eligible to be dispersed to the, town, the townships, whether they're organized or unorganized for projects uh, or before. Or the county. Well, or unorganized, that yeah, would be the county. Not, the county can um, utilize those funds as well, is my understanding. Oh gosh, I'm gonna have to read that, Joe. I don't know about that. You might be right on that um, because so the five year plan has to be done end of August applications have to be in end of October county commission awards before January 15 so it's a tight timeline it's the first time going through it so um, I'm hoping at least one or two from each township will attend. That's all I have. I, I have. I have two. Uh things uh, uh, we met uh, with JDAI uh, on a meeting last Friday morning. Uh, and from that and from the uh, email that you sent, um, I think I would like to have a meeting between uh, the Boys and Girls Club and your assistant so that I'm- Mary. So I'm sure that I know how fairly we're approaching things on the data results. Because I think, uh, wasn't it 63 to one? And actually that was probably a little over presented. It wasn't quite that good is my understanding. Um, no, what, what, what we did when Mary did our data is a little bit different than what uh, the Boys and Girls Club would have. They aren't aware of any that we don't send them. Okay. And so, I don't think Don, your, that's, her, her that's, report didn't say that though, did it? Um, it? It says on the bottom why they, they were not sent to diversion. Um, it's basically because the charges were um, too severe for us to yep. do diversion. So that, his his data not as in depth as ours, but we're the ones that have to send it into the yep. state to get the money back. So, um, I did provide Alec Don with what Mary did, and so I think he's going to share that at the next meeting with everybody. Okay. The commission just got it before everybody else did. So. I see. Well, I think uh, Alex has just, uh, reported that he had has had sixty three. Uh, referrals so far uh, 19 successful transactions and and one failure and I and I thought I understood you to say that there might be more than one failure depending upon how you looked at it yes so yes I, he like had to... he had one official failure he's correct okay. he's correct but I don't think you can count as a failure one he did not get correct Yep. I it just I just want to make sure that we're talking apples and apples. Apples to apples. Uh, and the other thing, uh, I I did meet uh, uh, informally, I guess, with Dan Speck, and uh, he was recommending that uh, we work on a a little more definite uh, in our ordinances on. Uh, what needs to be included in uh, shared wall? Yes, th th those kind of issues. I'm sure it's pressing. 
and don't know. He suggested that uh, uh, there could be a group of people that could uh, provide input data, uh, which may include uh, developers. Uh, legal. County. Maybe yeah, like a strategic planning. Or what he was or, or is he, what, was, what, he, what he was suggesting was that uh, when when uh, when a a customer comes in to us for a decision that 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 customer has had the opportunity to know everything that that we would expect them on a standard application to have provided. Right. That may or may not be there. Right. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I'm catching what you're saying. You're pitching and I'm not catching. I think the <laughs> just the takeaway is by the time it gets to here, there really shouldn't be as much discussion or question as what, what we have well, on that particular one. If they provide the information. Yeah, but what, what he's saying is we need to provide exactly what information needs to be provided. You know, we, we get, How do we know? We get uh, applications where there are exact drawings, there's down to the, you know, there their are automatic approvals. And we get other ones where we talk about for an hour. And I think what Don's getting to is, um, I'm sure he met with the zoning office, went to the planning commission, everything was fine. And then he gets to the board of adjustment and or you can't do that. A huge disconnect between planning commission, zoning office, um, and the ultimate approval with the board of adjustment. Because I, I guess we've, Don and I approved a lot of those, you know, through a conditional use process, but I guess something's changed now where we don't do that anymore. Well, I and it's I, not fair to I the don't applicant think it's, to do that. I, well, I don't think it's fair to the, mm -hmm citizens of Yankton County as a whole have just passed by five or seven people that we automatically rubber stamp it. He, I mean, it, he, I he, think he, that's he, why we have zoning rules. Yeah, he, yeah. He's not suggesting that. He's just suggesting that there should be a guideline that says these are the standard things that you're gonna need to provide. And this is generally the quality of input that you need to have. And that's Gary's, uh, it's Gary's task to help him get there. Well, sometimes when we get it, though, we just get the thing that says um, applicant on the north half of the northwest quarter of the southwest quarter of the east half wants to build a building. Yeah. Well, well, that's not particularly helpful to me. There's no drawing. I mean, there's a little picture. Oh, here's where it is on the map. Wanda, that's what that's what he was talking about. I think in this case, you know, he we did provide above and beyond for this type of business what would be needed for the packet. It's just that the ordinance didn't, didn't have that in there. So I don't think there was anything more he could have provided. It's just a matter of making an ordinance change if, if we decided to move forward on it. And, and that was the red line that I just sent to you for proposed for the September meeting, so. Okay, with that, if we need to pick that up, we can put on the agenda. Other than that, we'll leave it at, at uh, commissioner updates. Anything else done? I have, nope. I, um, I would move to go into executive session. I've got session. a quick one, fairly quick. So I met with um, Emma Great. She is running, I don't know, running, heading Ooh. up community. Emma Great. Um, she, it's a, Avera had applied for a grant for a, a program and was awarded it. And so she's employed by Avera at the time um, to facilitate a communities that care program. And what this program does. Um, they want to form a coalition within the community built upon community members. Uh, they would like to get out into the county as much as the city. Um, there's some issues with, with where schools are located compared to where districts 
taxpayers go and whatnot, but long and short of it is they would, there's uh, key, key members and then there's gonna be a coalition that's gonna be formed. Um, they were requesting some county representation. And so I raised my hand and said that I'd do that. Deb is uh, participating from the state's attorney's office. Um, I think somebody from the sheriff's department. Correct. Is or will be part of this. And the, the idea is to collaborate, get some ideas where it's a, it's a youth-based um, program. And so there's gonna be uh, input from, you know, Boys and Girls Club, from JDAI, Deb. Um, and they, they'd like to do, you know, polls and a study of what, what resources are needed and then what resources are available and where there might be duplication and how we can do it better and how we can expand and, and essentially have these citizens of the community that are part of this coalition take that and continue a program. Am I kind of? Yes, and the first step will be a, a data yes. and that'll come through a survey utilizing the school district. So yep. school district's a, another key. What Joe was referring to is we also have to realize that within Yankton County is Gabriel Vallon School District and also technically Irene to some extent that there's residents in well, Yankton there's, County. There's Bono. There's, 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 yeah, there's Bono. Viber. There's, yeah, Scotland Menno. So Freeman. Yeah. So, nice. and the, the way the grant's written, there's some issues there, but the point, I guess, is that uh, we need to work to include all of the county and not just the city. Um, is it Tabor part of Yankton County? Bon School District. So, long and short is, is I'll attend meetings um, on the county's behalf at this point, unless anybody else really wants to jump on it and uh, provide updates as we go. I think we'll... I know I'm going to miss the next meeting in August. No. August. The training? The, yes. Yes. But um, I think she mentioned they would like to schedule one more this fall. And then January is kind of the beginning of it. Yes. So. Okay. I am going to the August one, assuming my schedule allows. So. Okay. With that, Miss Wanda. I'd move to go into executive session for poor relief and or uh, personnel issues. Exec uh, litigation. Hmm? Litigation. Well, same difference. Litigation is not listed. Second. We don't have to. I also. Second. Move for a. Uh, so is that what 2813 is? Vote on that? Oh, this one does not have it, but yeah, you do. You there. did. Okay, they say I thought you. Okay. I okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Apparently, that's indigenous. We see. Yeah, I don't know. Might have been fixed.
500,000 for selling it. Raising Kings did it. That's who did it. Okay, microphone's on, please. I'll entertain a motion to come out of I executive would session. Move Second. to come out of executive session into regular session. Second that motion. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We are now in regular session. No action will be taken as a result of executive session. Items for next meeting. The item number 14 on this agenda yep. needs to be on the next one. The second reading of the Paulson rezone. That's all I have off the top of my head. I entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. We are now up. Any opposed? We are now adjourned.